Till then, I will talk to you all. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to be discussing the new gun laws that just got ramrodded through in Massachusetts. Now, how does it affect us in Connecticut? It doesn't, not really, but it does go above and beyond where Connecticut is in some places, which is kind of giving uh, our lawmakers and the anti 2 a people here pretty horrible ideas to try and implement. So, first and foremost, the way this was cobbled together, it was, it's House Bill 4885 out of Massachusetts. So I feel bad for all you uh, mass holes out there. Don't worry, I'm just giving you crap. You should hear what I call people from Connecticut. That being said, this bill was getting bounced around for about a year in different committees. And then, all of a sudden, it was rushed through, pushed out, being basically ramrodded through these uh, House and the Senate, and thrown on the governor's desk. Now, as of today, the 23rd, the governor has not signed it. Once this is signed, it does go in effect on August 1st of this year. Okay? Okay. A lot of things have been going on in the news. I'm sure all of you have been kept abreast of everything. It is like every day it seems like, you know, this day is going to go down in history, this and that. It's insane. It's, it's hard to keep up with the news media. So this you might have missed. All right. <clears throat> so you got to understand this new law that they're trying to push it is clearly unconstitutional. And how do we know this? Because the Supreme Court, via Bruin Heller, Catano, and the McDonald cases, have said all of these things are pretty much unconstitutional. Now they're rebuking what the Supreme Court has laid forth, and they're just going to push it through anyways. Of course, that means that lawsuits are going to abound. However, we know that Lawsuits take years to get through the court system before all the appeals are done and the courts pretty much crush them. So that's going to give the state of Massachusetts, or should I say the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a good five, six or plus years to really enforce these horrible, horrible laws. All right? But before we get started, I just wanted to say... I appreciate all the support. And the best way to support the channel is obviously like, comment. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel. Hit the little bell so you get the notifications. If you feel so inclined, you go down into the description below. You can pick up some really nice merch from the merch store. Lots of stuff available. We also have locals and Patreon. You can become a member and get specifically behind the scenes and Private footage that is not for the masses, things of that nature. So any bit helps keep the main channel absolutely free for everybody to use and get information mainly about the Second Amendment here in the New, Eng New England area. All right. Unless you're escaping like most people are trying to do. All right. Okay. So this bill, when interpreted as worst case scenario it would ban about 90 percent of all semi-automatic guns in massachusetts all right so again it's waiting on the signature from the governor it's not like the governor is not going to sign it they're going to veto no it's going to get signed that's a guarantee okay let's talk about a few of these things that are in there now i'm going to touch on some points that other channels have pretty much already touched on uh these were the ones that I thought were interesting or may have an, uh, more of an impact on us, their southern neighbors. So, first and foremost, Section 3 allows EBT cards to be used to purchase ammunition. Not firearms, but ammunition. Um, 
EBT is supposed to be used for buying food. Those are food stamps. Who, how are you going to allow them to use food stamps to buy ammunition? That's, that's insane. That's abuse. That's, I, I don't understand how that works, but whatever. If we move on to section 16, basically it's banning everything they've deemed an assault weapon or a large capacity magazine. Large capacity, large capacity magazines are basically anything over 10. It's an arbitrary number because standard capacity is what they're really talking about. I don't know why they are doing the 10. Connecticut has 10, and it's, it's a feel-good law. It really doesn't make much of a difference. Now, if you own these items before August 1st, you'll be allowed to keep the assault weapon, all right? The, what they call the assault weapon. Um, but you will be prohibited from uh, selling, transferring, anything like that. So if you own them, you're going to be stuck with them. So as of right now, it's not signed. So go out and buy them. Buy them in bulk, I guess. Um, when it comes to their large capacity magazines, um, if I read it correctly, if you didn't own it before... Uh, September 13th, 1994, with proof of purchase, you won't be able to own them. Uh, or at least you won't be able to take them out in public. You can keep them at home, but you can't load them, you can't keep them in your guns, things of that nature. All right? They are adding a mandatory registration, just like what Connecticut has. Um, it is barred what they call ghost guns or homemade guns, which... For the history of our country, building guns at home for personal use has always been legal. Now they're just, it's a ghost gun, they're banned. All right? They're creating a database to track gun violence, and from my understanding, gun sales, and a bunch of other things, which is a de facto registry just to make your life an even bigger living hell. They've expanded red flag laws, um, pretty much doing away with HIPAA. Uh, it allows healthcare workers to basically dime you out uh, and compel the courts using your HIPAA information to compel the courts to then have you red flagged and all your stuff confiscated and your permit revoked. Um, it goes on in other sections to talk about you're going to need an LTC which is a license to carry. That's what Massachusetts calls it. Uh, you're going to need an LTC to use a 3D printer or a CNC machine that has the capabilities of manufacturing guns. And they've just outright banned any 3D printer or CNC machine that has the primary purpose of making a firearm. Okay? So basically, if you have a chunk of aluminum, which is just a block of metal, and you have the skills and know-how to mill it down to a lower receiver using a CNC machine, well, that's illegal. All right? So, can't manufacture guns for personal use, right? I, I don't know. These, these bads are pretty, pretty bad. Uh, transferring guns. You can only do four private transfers per year, per LTC. Um... Now, here's where I question this one. So in Connecticut, we've always been able, well, in the past, we've always been able to do private transfers. I want to sell one of my firearms to, say, my neighbor. Now, my neighbor is also a permit holder. I can fill out the DPS threes. I was able to call, I sell a few, and get a transfer number, essentially getting the gun out of my name and putting it into my neighbor's name and having that transfer number, and then we both have copies of the DPS-3 for the rest of time to show that, yes, I did own it, and I then transferred it to this person. All right? It's got the transfer number and all that. So when you did that, the state basically ran the person that you were transferring it to through the NICS system. The ATF put a stop to that. They said you cannot do that. Private citizens 
are not supposed to be able to utilize the Nix system for rapid background checks to transfer firearms. Okay, so we're the only state right now in the union where this actually took effect. Other states can still do private transfers and utilize that, but not here in Connecticut. I don't know why. But in Massachusetts, you're only able to transfer four guns per year. But know this, Connecticut is being held to the standard to where during the private transfer, you're not allowed to use the NIC system to ensure the person you're transferring it to is not a prohibited person because it violates the law, according to the ATF. So how are you in Massachusetts going to do that? Because you have to basically get that background check done on that person before you transfer it because you can't knowingly transfer a gun to the prohibited person. Well, you I don't know how that's going to work. I really don't. Now, here's the kicker. Massachusetts has a roster of firearms that are allowed to be sold. All right, so the way Connecticut works is we have a list of guns that you can't sell. It's like you're not allowed to sell these items. All right, Massachusetts, much like New Jersey, says here's the list, boom, 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 of what you're allowed to sell. If it's not on the list, then it's a prohibited item. And you cannot sell it. Currently, as it stands on the list of allowed firearms, there are no semi-automatic rifles or semi-automatic shotguns, which means August 1st, whatever is not on this list, which does not include these semi-automatics that I just mentioned, you're done. If it's not on the list, you can't sell it, nor as a person, could you buy it? All right. Then they hit up on surrendering of firearms. So this one really bothered me. Here in Connecticut, if you have a protective order placed against you, and you don't, I mean, this is basically getting red flagged, or like if you're going through a divorce and you get a restraining order, things like that your permit is getting revoked and you have to surrender your firearms. Now in Connecticut, you're able to either turn them over to the police, you're able to transfer them to an FFL, and they could store it for you. You could transfer it to another family member who is, by law, a permit holder and, and can have them, or a friend, something like that. Um, and obviously they cannot then give it back to you. But you're able to transfer it to other people. So you're not... You're losing them, but they're not gone forever. However, in Massachusetts, they're changing the law. When this happens and you are compelled to surrender said firearms and ammunition, they were they are required now to be transferred. I'm just reading to make sure I get it right. Only to law enforcement. Then law enforcement is going to transfer them to a bonded warehouse for storage. Now, for some reason you're unable to get these firearms back or something happens and the bonded warehouse doesn't want to hold on to these, right? This is, remember, this is your property. This is stuff that you originally bought with your money. They're going to be auctioned off or sold and all proceeds will go to the state. Not to you, but to the state. So, you get red flagged, you get divorced, whatever. Something happens where your permit's revoked. The state police will then confiscate because you are, by law, having to surrender the guns. They go to them, to the warehouse. Then they're sold and all the money to the state, not to you. So you get nothing. Basically, they're going to seize them and that's it. No compensation. You're just SOL. That's is not how it's supposed to work. That is not okay. There are laws that say the government cannot just take your property and then do what they will with it. All right? They cannot use eminent domain to seize your land without paying you fair market value for it because that's the law. But here, they're seizing all your firearms and ammunition and keeping all the money for themselves. Absolutely disgraceful. But this is what people have voted for. They elect these politicians that enact these dystopian laws. So I guess you get what you vote for. All right?
There you go. So that is pretty horrible. They have added a ton of training to the initial training courses you have to take to get your LTC. So right in Connecticut, it's pretty simple. You used to just take a basic firearm safety course, something like what the NRA offers, um, and then that was it. And then we changed it last year to where now you have to take the basic safety course, the eight-hour course, with a live fire component, and the instructor has to teach you about Connecticut's laws. And that's it. That's what they changed. So USCCA had to revamp the curriculum. NRA said we are not revamping anything, but there is a addendum that the state police had put out for instructors to use, things of that nature. The instructor also has to issue you an affidavit saying, I, the instructor, taught said person about Connecticut laws, storage laws, etc. However, in Massachusetts, I am bringing it up right now, um, I legit had to read through the law, okay, um, and I'll put a link down in the description below for this exact bill. All right. I just searched the term training and it, it pops up on page 76 of the 116 page bill. Uh, I'm just going to give you the gist of it. I'm not just going to read it verbatim. If you want to go through it and read it verbatim, go ahead. Uh, it's going into the firearm safety instructor shall be valid for a period of 10 years unless sooner revoked by reason of unsuitability, which they've expanded their ability to use the, def, the, the word of unsuitability to revoke permits, things of that nature. Now, the certifying of the firearms instructor is coming from the state police. All right, so here in Connecticut, like I take the instructor course from the NRA or from the USCCA, I became a certified instructor and I can teach classes. Right? I have a lot of other certificates, but that's basically how it works. Massachusetts is different because after you get that, you still have to be certified by the state themselves. All right. So it gets in there. Uh, applicants for certification as instructors under section blah, 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 blah. Okay. Upon applications, Colonel of the State Police may, may at their discretion certify you as a firearms instructor. I'm just trying to get to the nitty-gritty of what you have to do. Okay, here we go. If you're teaching a firearm safety course, you will provide this curriculum. A, the safe use, handling, and storage of firearms. Okay, that makes sense. That's everybody's curriculum. B, methods for securing and child-proofing firearms. All right, child storage laws. C, the applicable laws relating to the possession, transportation, storage of firearms. So much like Connecticut, the laws that govern these items. D. Knowledge of operation, potential dangers, and basic competency in the ownership and use of firearms. So basically we have to, or those instructors are going to have to explain to you like the perils that come with it. Right? It sounds like almost like we have to almost talk people out of it. You have to do injury and suicide prevention and harm reduction education. That's always been part of the curriculum. Um, so if you ever took a Massachusetts course here in Connecticut for a non-resident permit, that was part of the curriculum. Right? It's basically, hey, don't kill yourself. Which, listen, if you're having bad thoughts like that, uh, seek help, please. All right, you have to also teach all applicable laws re uh, relating to use of force. So basically, oh, hey, if you shoot somebody in self-defense, here's all the things the state is going to do to you. All right? You have to teach disengagement tactics. So basically, how to run away, how to de-escalate. Um, that is not part of of the NRA course. It is not part of the USCCA course. So I don't know, unless, uh, unless Massachusetts has their own um, disengagement tactics course, I don't, I don't understand because nobody currently offers that as part of their curriculum, unless USCCA is going to revamp their curriculum again, specifically for that state. And of course, you must have a live fire training. 
this section does not break down what that live fire consists of, the target, how many rounds, etc. The Department of State Police may impose a $50 fee for initial issuance of such a certificate to offset the cost of certifying instructors. So, in Connecticut, you want to become a firearms instructor, you take the course, and then you start teaching. That's it. Massachusetts is going to charge you to become an instructor and teach courses. Look, the instructors don't make a lot of money to begin with per student. And they're charging you to, to do this. I'm like, okay. The fee for certification renewal shall be only $10. That's not bad, but you shouldn't be charged to be an instructor, whatever. It goes on to say, any firearms instructor certified under this section may, in their discretion, issue a basic firearm safety certificate to any person who successfully completes the requirements for the basic firearm safety course approved by the colonel. No firearms safety instructor shall issue or cause to be issued any basic firearm certificate to any person who fails to meet minimum requirements. Uh, of the of the prescribed course of study, including, but and it goes on and on and on. Listen, if you're an instructor and you're letting students get these certificates and you don't feel comfortable, you should not be issuing them. You are first line defense. So do me a favor. If you're an instructor and you have a weirdo in class, be honest with me. Like, I don't feel comfortable teaching. Go somewhere else. All right. So. They've expanded their training. It's above and beyond what normal courses uh, require. All right. Now, the only silver lining that I could find um, throughout this whole thing, I found it originally, and then literally I saw it like within 20 minutes on CCDL's Facebook page, is this, that non-residents, be me, I'm not a resident, Non-residents, nor you if you live in Connecticut, may carry a firearm on them while in a vehicle lawfully while traveling through the Commonwealth. However, the gun must remain in the vehicle. Okay, So you can drive through Massachusetts because you're traveling and you can keep your gun on you. But you can't stop. That includes, so normally like traveling through New York, you have to, you know, break your gun down. It's got to be locked in a separate case in your ammunition in a compartment that is not accessible from the passenger compartment. All right, so a real trunk or something like a, a toolbox in the bed of a pickup truck, something like that. And hard stops are like getting off the highway. So a soft stop is getting, you're still on the highway system, but you're using a rest stop to use the bathroom, maybe grab something to eat. Um, fill up your gas, whatever. So my suggestion is, if you are traveling further north, like New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, whatever, fill, make sure you're filled up before you go through Mass. I mean, most people can leave anywhere in Connecticut and still get through Massachusetts on one tank of gas. So make sure your, your tank is filled before you reach the border. All right? But you can keep your gun on you. So you don't have to stop at that last rest stop in Connecticut, unload your gun, and do all that. You can just keep it on you and just go through Massachusetts, all right? It says lawfully. Now, how many officers are going to know this part of the law? Probably none. So, you get pulled over for speeding. You don't have a LTC in Massachusetts, nor a non-resident permit. You're in possession of your gun. It's on your body. Be prepared to have problems with the cops. Be prepared to probably get arrested. Uh, unless the state really does a great job in informing troopers that, hey, this is allowed under our new law. People can travel through the state. All right? The part where it says you must, it must remain in the vehicle, all right, means you can't have it on you and get out of the car or get out of your truck. 
if it is not in direct control of you, then your firearm shall be stored in accordance with Section 131 Charlie. So basically, it's got to be locked up, unloaded, this, that, and the other thing, right? Um, so just get through Massachusetts lawfully as fast as you can. Now, the nice part is, it's the only silver lining, is it's always a pain in the ass to stop in Connecticut, have to do all of this, and then continue on traveling. And then when you get to a state where it's constitutional carry or you have reciprocity, to then reload your gun, get it back on your head, this and that. I mean, it's not that pain of a, it's not that big of a pain in the ass, but it's still, it's a pain in the ass. First is just going about your way. So that's great. I can now, if I'm heading up to New Hampshire, I can traverse Massachusetts, and I don't have to stop and take my gun off, put and lock it all up, and I just go on about my merry way. That's not bad. Wish all the states were like that, but they're not. So, like I said in the beginning, I'm sure there are going to be a ton of lawsuits by different residents of Massachusetts in different firearms uh, groups, nothing from the NRA, which they did touch on it, but they really don't do much anymore. They've kind of lost their way. Um, so hopefully maybe the GOA, um, FPC, but there should be a ton of lawsuits trying to fight this in court. And of course, the courts are anti-two-way themselves, at least the lower courts. So you've got to work your way up to even past the appeals court because the appeals courts usually don't find in favor of Second Amendment rights, even though it's pretty clear from Bruin, Heller, Catano, McDonald, all these cases, the Supreme Court is pretty much set forth, especially Bruin, where they're like history and tradition. So basically, how was it in 1791 when the Bill of Rights were codified? That's how it's supposed to be today. So if it wasn't law then, then it's not part of our history and tradition. There you go. All right. That's pretty much all I have for you. Please support the channel by going down below in the description, hitting the merch store up, or at the very least, subscribe to the channel. It's free. It helps with the algorithm. Hit up the comment, se the comment section, and uh, hopefully I'll be doing a live here soon. I've got to cobble together a few things, but... Um, I've been messing around with OBS and setting a few things up, and I wanted to give it a try. So hopefully here in the next week or two, um, I can give you guys a couple of days head start knowing when I'm going to do this live stream, and we'll do a live stream one of these evenings. It's basically just going to be a Q&A. All right, that's all I've got for you. Until then, I will talk to you later. You guys have a great day.